we wrote a freaking book. <laughs> I really want to. I want to acknowledge. I mean, it's been an amazing community effort. I, I want to acknowledge that Martin did uh, something that was true when he said some people were skeptical about whether this could or should be done. That some person he was referring to was me. I was wrong. Martin was right, reaffirming the point that whenever I disagree with Martin. It's Martin is correct. Uh, but Martin did an amazing job in pulling off this community effort. Um, so I, I want you to know that you do. Actually, it's funny. We said to, we were worried about what was going to happen, which is there's a stream of people going to the back of the room to get their copy of the book, which is pretty awesome. Um, I just uh, So I don't want everybody to go to the back of the room and get their book yet. But what I'd like you to do is stand up if you are excited that you're going to get a copy of the Book of Odyssey. <laughs> Very good. So. You, they'll always be free online, Siegfried. All right. So, um, so the last last bit of talk that we want to do is is what you heard from from Claire and, and Andrew is that we're starting to make really good progress on data quality, and what you heard from Martine was that we're starting to make progress as a community on best practices, so that we think we can generate evidence in a reliable way. But we still got a problem. How do we prove that the evidence that we're generating is actually reliable? And so what I'm going to walk through here is some work that several of us have been working on and George and I have been um, uh, largely stewarding, which is to think about how can we do some sort of proof that we actually can trust the evidence that we're generating by following the Odyssey best practices. Uh, and, and, and to do that, um, uh, I've got a, just curious, uh, on, on any given Saturday evening, how do you guys like to spend your time? Like, How many of you like just to, to watch some Netflix or hang out with kids or and just go exercise or something. Because I can tell you, for the last couple months, what I've been doing is reading federal regulations. <laughs> uh, Saturday night, just you know, pull out. And I'm not talking about like the new blockbusters, like the RWE framework or the EMA big day thing. I'm not talking about going back to the classics. Uh, you know, reading the FDAC, uh, FTC Act of 1962 and actually getting all the way in there into Section 505D, because that's what I do on a Saturday night. Um, reason that we were actually spending some time actually reviewing this is because if we talk about uh, reliable evidence, I think it's important for us to not talk about reliable evidence in the context of how do we use real world data. I think we need to actually start talking about what's reliable evidence in the context of evidence. Because actually our regulators around the world have provided very clear descriptions about what makes reliable evidence. And I think instead of us thinking about how do we water down our regulations to produce evidence so that real world data can be acceptable, I think instead Instead, we need to look ourselves in the eye and say, okay, what are these standards for reliable evidence, and how do we meet those standards? And we've used regulatory decision making as a, a, a construct here uh, only because it seems logical and it makes sense to me that regulatory decision making is simply one stakeholder group that we're trying to support. But the decisions that are made at a societal level uh, are, are important. And if, if evidence is of sufficient reliable quality for uh, regulatory decision making, then likely it can also be useful for clinical decision making and payer decision making and other stakeholder decision making. So we thought it was really necessary and valuable for us to I'm going to keep looking through a bottle. Uh, uh, I think it's really important for us just to actually ask the question, well, what is uh, reliable evidence? And when, when uh, we were reviewing this, we went back and we looked at the um, uh, Section 505D. There's a definition of substantial evidence in our, in our regulations for, for guidance. It says that evidence is consisting of adequate and well-controlled investigations, including clinical investigations, by experts qualified by scientific training experience to evaluate the effectiveness of the drug involved on the basis of which could fairly and reproduce uh, res uh, responsibly be concluded by such experts that the drug will have the effect it purports or is represented to have under the conditions of use prescribed, recommended, or suggested in the labeling or proposed labeling thereof. Huh. 
That is a mouthful, but basically it comes down to this phrase, adequate and well-controlled investigations, and what does that mean? Um, in 2000, or 1997, there was an amendment to that that says that the FDA secretary can determine based on relevant science that data from one adequate and well-controlled study, uh, well-controlled clinical investigation and confirmatory evidence, which would be obtained prior to or after such investigation, may be sufficient to establish effectiveness if the secretary considers such evidence uh, uh, to constitute substantial evidence. So this raises a question. Okay, we, we now can understand that we need one or more pieces of adequate and well-controlled investigations and we want some confirmatory evidence. And the question is, how do we actually meet that requirement? So that got me to another Saturday night where I got to drive into even more of the electronic codes of federal regulations, where I got to get into section 304 subpart D, section 314.126, which provides us our definition of adequate and well-controlled studies. And I read this because I had been hearing from lots of people, and maybe many of you are more worse in this than I, but I had been hearing from lots of people talking about how what this statute says is that you need to conduct randomized clinical trials. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm eager to see why that is. And in fact, it's a much, much more thoughtful document that I would encourage all of you to read because it's actually uh, quite disciplined in what it's trying to do. It's trying to provide principles for us to understand when evidence could be considered valid. And broadly speaking, it lays out seven criteria that uh, I'm providing the, the, the main sentence here, um, that there's a clear statement of objectives of the investigation and a summary of the methods in a protocol. There's the, and, and I would say that the reason for that is we're trying to reduce the threat of investigator bias. The, the study uses a design that permits, uh, permits a valid comparison with a control to provide a quantitative assessment of the drug effect. This is we're trying to mitigate the risk of selection selection bias. There's that the method of selection of subjects provides adequate assurance that the disease or condition being studied. This is a question of measurement error. And there's that the method of assigning patients to treatment and control groups minimizes bias as intended to assure the comparability of the groups. So here the concern is confounding and the usual strategy we might do is randomization. We also are concerned about our adequate measures are can taken to minimize bias on the part of the subjects, observers, and analysts, and this is an issue of selection bias. It describes that methods for the assessment of subjects' uh, response are well-defined and reliable. Again, this is an issue of measurement error. How do we know that we can trust our outcomes? And then it also describes that the analysis of the results of the study, uh, or study is adequate to assess the effects of the drug, and that the report of the study should describe the results and the analytic methods used to evaluate them, including any appropriate statistical methods. And this is a question of model misspecification. And what I found really insightful and thoughtful about this document in reading it is that that I actually think that all of these are really good, reasonable, responsible requirements that all good, reliable evidence should satisfy. And yet I'm ashamed to admit that you know, some of the research I've done probably falls short on some of these dimensions. But what this document does not state is that the only way to generate reliable evidence is through randomized clinical trials. In fact, very explicitly on, on a couple of these bullets, it says uh, usually randomization could be considered. Now, uh, many of you know I'm not really a, a usual kind of a guy. Uh, and so the question that I wanted to ask was, well, okay, um, we understand that usually randomization might be a strategy to deal with one of these threats to validity, um, but what could we actually be doing as a community to try to generate evidence that we might actually satisfy some or all of these criteria? And to take those threats to really re realize that as a community, we've all been working on bits and pieces to actually establish a solution for real world evidence that would actually satisfy these things. In fact, Martine's best practices hit on a lot of these things. We need to be able to fully and pre-specify protocols. We need to be able to have a study design choice where we can execute diagnostics that prove that we're free of selection bias and confounding. We need to be able to do phenotype evaluations so that we understand the extent of our measurement error. Uh, and, and and we need to be able to uh, have a process that is objective and reproducible. And it turns out that pretty much every one of these threats to validity, we now have a chapter in a book that describes you how you could do this. Now, 
that's all fine and good that we actually uh, could make arguments that observational studies could satisfy these requirements if we tried. But the, the challenge we actually have is even after we make those arguments, how do we actually trust real world evidence? And one strategy that many people have been thinking about is, well, maybe we could compare the evidence we generate from real world evidence to evidence that we already trust, namely randomized clinical trials. We think randomized clinical trials are evidence that we trust, so the question would be, how close to those randomized trials do we get if we were to conduct similar questions in observational data? Now, there's an interesting thing about this, which is that if our real-world evidence is reliable, we wouldn't actually necessarily expect it to match randomized trials. After all, we've got bigger sample size. We're talking about real-world practice, so it's effectiveness, it's not efficacy. And the whole reason we want to understand the real-world population is because we want to be generalizable to the world, not the confines of that clinical trial. So there's an awkward disconnect that we've got here, which is we're going to think about using a randomized trial as a gold standard, even though that's not necessarily our aspiration. But nonetheless, we need to be able to do something to prove to ourselves that the evidence we're generating might actually be trusted, and in absence of anything else, maybe a trial would be useful. So okay, we want to compare randomized trials with observational studies. This raises a question, how do we know that two studies actually agree? So let me provide you a simple, uh, simple thought exercise. If I showed you two studies, study number one produced a relative risk of one with a confidence interval from 0.8 to 1.2, and study number two produced the same point estimate in the same confidence interval, raise your hand if you feel like these studies agree. How many people feel like these studies are in agreement? I like, a th like a third of the people think that two studies with the identical statistics agree. That means two-third of you are going to be a hard bargain to, to argue with. Okay, but that's, that's interesting, that a third of you think that two studies that give identical results are in agreement, and others of you are not raising your hands. Maybe you've already checked out, or you're already checking out your book of Odyssey. That's okay. Let me give you another example, then. What if I told you two studies both produced the exact same effect estimate, a 1.3 with a confidence interval from 1.04 to 1.63. Raise your hand if you would conclude that these two studies are in agreement. Raise your hand high. All right, it looks like we got like maybe like a half of the room thinks that two studies with the identical result are in agreement. Um, so that's interesting too. Okay, uh, maybe I'll try an easier one then. Uh, what if one study produces a statistically significant decreased risk and another study produces a statistically significant increased risk? So they're producing estimates on the opposite side of the null. How many of you would agree that these two studies are in agreement? All right, good. So, so it seems like we can't agree when we agree, but we can agree to disagree. All right, very good. Okay, so this thing is, these are actually simple examples that we could think of as thought experiments. It turns out in the real world, there's lots of different ways that studies could agree or disagree. So we have to think about, for example, like, what if both studies are statistically significant? Um, what if one study is significant, but the, uh, but the confidence interval is subsumed within the other? Or what if one study has more uncertainty than another? Or what if one study has a tight confidence interval that's contained inside of the confidence interval of the other one? What do we do then? What if we flip the study so that study one is study two and study two is study one? What's going to happen then? What if the confidence interval partially overlap? Uh, what if both studies have really, really tight confidence intervals so the effect estimates are kind of close, but we think that we're, we're confident about these things? These are actually non-trivial questions, which means this idea, this superficial notion that we're going to compare studies and say they agree is actually turns out to be a pretty thorny problem to solve. And it turns out that people have been thinking about this for a while, and there's been different measures that have been produced to try to get some sort of assessment of concordance or agreement between two studies. Uh, and actually, what we read, as we dug into this research, what we realized is lots of people are saying there is no one way to do this, and yet lots of people are trying different approaches, and nobody knows how well those approaches actually work. 
So what are some approaches that have been considered? Well, uh, for those of you who've taken any stats 101 course, you know what a z-test is. You can actually just compare two distributions and say, are those distributions similar? That's a measure of agreement. One could consider whether if the study two effect estimate is inside of the confidence interval of, of the other one, maybe that's agreement. Or maybe you could say study one's point estimate is inside of confidence interval. Or maybe you say, I just need two, th two studies to have statistical significance in agreement. Maybe that's another one. Or maybe you want to think about a meta-analysis as an approach to try to figure out whether there's information content. It turns out we looked at a whole lot of these measures, but the one thing we kept coming back to is there is no one right method for assessing concordance, though we have our opinions about it, um, but that none of them do we actually know how well these metrics would work. So if I say we're aspiring to prove that real-world evidence is in agreement with, with uh, randomized trials, like how do I know what good is good enough? So, why does this actually matter? Like, does this matter that there's a bunch of funky statistics out there? Turns out that it kind of does. So uh, statistical concordance, or that z-test, basically what you're looking at is um, uh, z-test is trying to measure whether or not two studies' dif distributions are different. And so you can compare them and try to take a look at that. If I use those examples that I just showed, you'll see that in some of those examples I put up, the concordance test fails and some of them it passes at a P less than 0.05. Study, uh, and, I, and I should mention that this, this, uh, this idea of um, uh, statistical concordance, this is something that has been used in replication studies in the past. Um, uh, Doug Altman had a really nice uh, piece about why, this, why he argues that this was an appropriate statistic back in BMJ back in 2003, but it's not commonplace that we see this in all replication studies. Um, Brian Nosick published a really nice paper in Science a couple years back that actually spurred some of this discussion about the challenges of the uh, reproducibility crisis that we're in. Uh, and in that study, where they tried to replicate a series of psychology studies, um, one of the primary metrics they used was something called what we're calling study one estimate agreement. The basic idea was that uh, the first study that you're trying to replicate, it has a point estimate of some sort, and you ask yourself the question, is that new study that you're that you are performing, does its confidence interval contain the point estimate of the first study? And that's a totally reasonable thing that one could consider. It has a challenge, which is if your second study has a much bigger sample size, then you might actually uh, uh, have a hard time actually satisfying this concordance. So what happens when I take those same test cases and I run uh, Brian Nosick's metric instead of Doug Altman's metric? Well, those same exact exemplars, now you can see study one agreement fails, 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 passes, fails, passes, fails, passes. So maybe we need a different metric. Well, study, study two estimate agreement flips that idea around. It basically says, let's treat the first study as the range of possible estimates we might consider. And then we'll take our second study, that is our replication, we'll take its point estimate and we'll ask, is that contained in the study? This is actually one of the metrics that uh, Jesse Franklin is using in the uh, project that Harvard has go ongoing with Harvard um, to evaluate consistency of randomized trials and observational studies. So um, if it's uh, something that uh, is of interest there, we thought that's probably a metric we should try to better understand as well. So what happens when we apply that to those exact same test cases? Well, now you get fail, fail, pass, 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 fail, fail, fail. So statistical decision agreement, this is also one that is, uh, is being considered uh, under the FDA um, Harvard collaboration looking at uh, randomized trials. And specifically, the idea of this is like, do you get the same headline? Do two studies both achieve statistical significance in consistent directions, or are they inconsistent on the basis of P less than 0.05? Uh, and uh, this is a metric that is uh, perfectly uh, reasonable to consider when you're making binary decision outcomes, and that's, uh, I think, part of the notion that goes into this. So what happens when we take those same test cases and run that through? Fail, pass, fail, pass, pa fail, 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 pass. So we're getting different answers on the same test cases depending on what happens with these metrics. Now, another one that Brian Nosick actually recommended was um, what we're going to term meta-analysis variance test. Basically, the idea is you've got your first study, 
You conduct your replication study, you perform a meta-analysis to combine those estimates, and you ask yourself the question, did my confidence interval get tighter? That is, did I learn new information to be more confident, or were the two studies far enough away that I actually am now more uncertain? Seems reasonable as an approach. We could just think about carrying out random, random effects meta-analysis to do this task. And what happens when we do that? We get fail, fail, pass, 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 fail, fail, fail. Now, it turns out that um, I've shortened my presentation to go through all of the different uh, uh, metrics that we've seen, but one of the key insights that we gained is anybody who's gonna do any sort of agreement, any sort of estimate of performance of real-world Evans versus trials, the very first thing you need to understand is that metric matters, and that metric choices are going to actually determine what kind of results you see. And so I could game any system I wanted just by picking the the metric that gets me the answer that I want. So it's super important if we're gonna run any sort of experiments that we pre-specify the metrics that we think are important. And none of these metrics are inherently right or wrong, though we do have our own biases of which ones we prefer, but, they're, but instead they represent different types of answers to the question, do two studies agree? And you can see that all of these on their own are totally reasonable metrics, but when applied to the exact same set of test cases, they produce divergent results. So we need to know what our metric is, and we need to know how that metric's gonna compare to other metrics if we're gonna interpret any of this information. So if different agreement metrics are gonna produce different results using the same set of studies, well this actually presents a real challenge for us because if we want to compare studies, we need to have some sort of a benchmark to know how well our agreement metrics perform. Now, like two thirds of you didn't even raise your hand when I said two studies had identical results. So this is um, gonna be an interesting thought experiment to go through. Um, how many of you feel like th that our goal for agreement should be 100%? Raise your hand. How many people feel like we need, Danny feels like we need to get 100% agreement? So the, the, the target would be that if we're gonna say we agree with trials, then for every trial we try, we should be able to get a randomized trial to get the answer. How many of you feel like uh, good enough is 50%? Mark says 50%. You, you, we've got a couple that say 50%. Good. So you're saying if I get the answer wrong 50% of the time, you'll say, yeah, good enough. Okay. Uh, how many people are below 50% and will feel good with agreement? Raise your hand. How many people are above 50%? Raise your hand. All right, keep your hands up high. 50%? 60%? 70%? 80%? Some hands go down. 81, 82, 85, 90, 90, okay, every, uh, most tail, we got 95, 96, 96 is the magic number, okay, we got, oh, we got one more, 97, 98, all right, so, so notice around the room, we all have different perceptions about what is the right level of agreement, and that's actually a problem, because if we were to run a study and compare things, and I were to say, huzzah, we achieve agreement 80% of the time, two people could look at that same number, and they could say, well, geez, that's disappointing to me, it's disappointing to Danny, and it's a thrill for Mark. So what we actually need to know is not just how often we agree, we need to know what's the expectation of agreement. Like, what would agreement look like if we were actually perfect? And what would agreement look like if we were wrong? If we could have those benchmarks, then we could measure the performance of comparing studies, and then we could determine whether or not we should be proud of the best practices that we've created. So uh, that's what we set out to do, is actually do this methodologic benchmarking to just figure out how are we gonna actually trust that observational data is reliable. So I wanna go back to our hypertension example. So last year you heard Mark and Martine and I present on Legend, where we systematically reviewed the uh, AHA hypertension guidelines uh, and examined all the evidence that was available and we presented some of the clinical applications uh, of that work.
And you, you may recall that one of the things we specifically focused on was the clinical guideline that specified uh, that um, for choice of initial medication for hypertension, the guideline said that they had uh, grade A clinical trial review evidence that supported the assertion that initiation of antihypertensive drug therapy, first line agents can include thiazide diuretics, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin reception blockers. And this was based on randomized clinical trials. And in fact, they did a great job in that uh, guideline of providing a systematic review with all the evidence from all the clinical trials for all of the different uh, drugs. And we highlighted the fact that we think this is a tremendous resource of randomized trial evidence that we've been able to rely on to support our research. What I'm showing you here is a network diagram that actually shows the totality of the randomized evidence that was available. In this particular case, looking at when the outcome was acute myocardial infarction. You're seeing the little circles. Oh, my little arrow's not showing. There you go. That, that's not going to work. That's all right. Um, the little circles represent the drug classes. The arrows between the circles represent if there was one or more clinical trials conducted. And that estimate underneath represents the direct meta-analysis combining the trials together. So what you notice here is that multiple of those arrows list more than one trial, which means we can actually understand, uh, do trials agree with each other? Maybe that would be an interesting benchmark to consider, because if we're going to compare observational studies to trials, maybe we should try to benchmark ourselves on do trials agree with each other and to what extent that actually happens. So if we dig into just one of those nodes there, we can look at ACE inhibitors and thiazide diuretics, and you can see on the line, they showed three studies. There's the ALL-HAT trial, the ANBP2 trial, and the Phyllis study. And the interesting thing is that we're making two class comparisons, but in fact, when you dig into that, what you see is that the all-hat study compared, compared, thi uh, compared chlorothaladone to lisinopril, and it produced a relative risk of 1.01 with a confidence interval from 0.93 to 1.1. The ANBP trial compared hydrochlorothiazide to enalapril, and it produced a relative risk of 1.47 with a confidence interval from 1.02 to 2.13. Uh, now, one of the things to first note is I'm going to compare two trials, but neither of the drugs are actually the same. We have to make a leap of faith that drugs in the same class have the same effect because there weren't actually two trials done comparing chlorothaladone and lisinopril. So instead, I'm going to uh, assume drugs in the same class are consistent, which is the assumption made in the systematic review that supports the clinical guidelines. What you'll notice is that even though that arrow had three studies, if you actually pull, in the, pull out the literature for that third study, they don't actually report a relative risk estimate for that study. They actually just report a count of how many myocardial infarctions were observed. So the question for us is, how consistent are current randomized trials uh, in this space of hypertension? What I'm really asking is, for example, of those metrics of agreement, does all hat and ANBP2, do they actually agree with each other? And to answer that question, we have to pick a metric. We have to apply the metric to those estimates, and we have to see whether or not we passed or failed. But we're not just going to do it for that trial. We're going to do it for every pairwise comparison of all randomized trials that have been done in hypertension because that'll give us a sense of how often do clinical trials actually agree. So to, point to, to highlight this, we need to recognize that there is, there is an idea of a target trial that we would actually be doing if we were actually trying to replicate. You know, the idea that a study to be a replication should be the same on all characteristics. You know, a randomized trial, we would of course randomize, but that means everything you know about a patient prior to randomization should be the same. You would randomize to treatment arms, uh, and you'd want those treatment arms to be the same. You would have to decide what is that actual causal contrast that you're studying, and that would need to be the same. You need to define your outcomes the same way. You need to have your analysis process be the same way. And so what we're about to show you is what happens when we try to compare randomized trials in hypertension, recognizing that it's not exactly an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. 
Why? Because our current practice as a research community is we're, there's a lot of counter incentives going against the idea that you would conduct the exact same experiment in the exact same way because every time we make one of these multi hundred million dollar investments to do one of these studies, we want to learn something new. We don't want to just learn what we already learned. But in fact, if we are going to get to the, the heart of re replication, we absolutely need to have experiments where we can do things systematically and repeatedly. Okay, so this was a moment of despair for me. I said, okay, fine, we agreed this is something we're gonna do. I'm gonna pull out everything in hypertension. I'm just gonna compare this vast number of clinical trials where it's the same drug, the same target drug, the same, same compared to the same outcome. I'm sure we can have lots of those to work with. After all, hypertension is the most studied area in, in, in all of medicine. Uh, this is robust systematic review. Turns out that if you pull out that systematic review, there are only 15 examples of randomized trials where we can actually perform this replication. That is that there's a target comparator outcome that are sufficiently similar that we've got two studies that we can do this, uh, ask the question, do two trials agree with each other? So, do two trials agree with each other? Well, there are your effect estimates that you see. And I know that you're, those in the back are probably squinting or, or still reading their book. Um, so I'll just show you a couple examples to highlight this. So here is that comparison of all hat versus ANBP, uh, here for the outcome of heart failure. And what you could see is in the all hat study, there was a statistically significant increased risk. In the ANBP study, we actually observed no difference with a relative point estimate of 0.85 and a confidence interval from 0.62 to 1.18. Uh, and, and what I'm showing you down below is what happens when we apply those various metrics to that particular example. You can see the concordance test says pass, our other four metrics say fail. Here if we look at a different outcome, also comparing all hat versus ANBP, now the outcome is stroke, we can see that all hat produced a statistically significant increased risk, ANBP produced a non-significant uh, difference. Now if I look at my metrics, I get pass, fail, pass, pass, pass. If you look at yet another, the value trial, to see how it compared versus the VART trial, we can see the value trial had a, point, a statistically significant uh, increased risk. The VART trial actually had a point estimate of two, but a confidence interval that went from 0.2 to 22. So it's either a five-fold decreased risk or a 20-fold increased risk. Um, that's what we call uncertain. <laughs> What happens when we apply our agreement metrics to these two trials? Pass, fail, pass, fail, pass. Okay. Now, I can show you anecdotes uh, all around, but ultimately what we need to know is what is the level of agreement we should expect if two clinical trials are replicating each other? And so we can actually compute that. We can compute what percentage of trial-trial pairs would pass our definition of agreement. And what we can see is, depending on what metric you set, you'll actually get a different, uh, a different uh, performance. So the concordance, uh, the concordance uh, randomized trials achieved 87% agreement. That significance decision agreement, the idea that two studies have to be significant on the same size, that actually, for trials only achieved 67% agreement. And study two is also 67%. So that idea that Danny was wrong, because he said he wanted 100% agreement, and I would say 100% agreement is unreasonable to expect, because we can't expect trials to replicate, uh, observational studies to replicate trials better than trials replicate each other. Uh, at, at best, we could consider this to be some sort of a upper bound to say, can we get kind of close to this? So this was an insight that we, that, that we had that we thought was actually um, uh, interesting is we no longer should be expecting if we're going to do assessments of agreement that agreement means perfect. Instead what it means is we need to see that a level of agreement is reasonable to what we would expect, what we hope to see. Now what did we do with legend? In legend, we systematically evaluated every pairwise comparison of every hypertension drug for every safety and effectiveness outcome that we could find. We used the same design and exactly replicated every detail, but we didn't have randomization. We had to do propensity score adjustment, and this is the nut of the, the nut of the challenge we have, which is people are concerned that if you don't have randomization, that your evidence won't necessarily be in agreement. 
I showed you the guidelines actually suggest randomization is only one part of the threats to validity. So we should broaden that more specifically to say, uh, what if, given all of those threats to validity, how accurate does observational studies get? I'm, what I'm going to show you is how well we do in legend, but I want to make a very important point, which is to say, what I'm going to show you is not how well all observational studies replicate clinical trials. It's only how well Odyssey studies do when running across a network, following the scientific best practices that Martine showed you before, we can produce an estimate of that. Uh, I'm quite keen to see what comes out of the, the FDA Harvard project to see what estimate they perform, because that is a different approach to generating evidence. But what we're going to be able to think about is, given that we already a priori specified the legend experiment, and the protocol and the code is publicly available, and all the results are publicly available, all we had to do was say, let's go get the estimates out of legend and match them up to the clinical trials and see how well we agree. And it turns out, unlike the dearth of evidence we had with only 15 trial-trial comparisons, we actually could find 31 estimates from the randomized trials, and we could actually compare those to uh, all of the legend estimates. Now, 30 is not really a big number. It's probably not enough to, to be, um, uh, to, to be uh, all that we need, but 31 is a good enough number for us to at least get started to produce some sort of an estimate here. So what does the agreement look like when we compare randomized trials to legend? It's pretty, isn't it? I'll just give you a couple examples maybe to help you. Here's an example where the ANBP trial, that same one that we looked at comparing enalapril and hydrochlorothiazide for stroke, the estimate produced by the trial was 1.02 uh, with a non-significant confidence interval, and the legend estimate for the exact same target, the exact same comparator, the exact same outcome, we produced an effect estimate of 0 0.98 with a confidence interval that pretty much on top. No matter which metric you chose off of our list, this would be an instance where we could say we're in agreement. Here's an example where the all-hat trial, uh, lisinopril versus uh, chlorothalidone for stroke, if we compare that to the legend result, you can see that all-hat produced a statistically significant effect of 1.15. Legend produced a statistically insignificant effect of 1.14. Now, I think 1.14 and 1.15 are pretty close to each other but it depends on your metric. If your metric is statistical significance agreement, then we'd have to say these two don't agree. In this case, four out of five of our metrics would say that we are in agreement and one of them wouldn't. Now here's a study where the value trial uh, compared valsartan versus amlodipine, uh, and it produced a statistically significant increased risk of 1.12. Our legend estimate is actually uh, 0 0.89 and non-significant. In this particular example, no matter which metric we choose, we fail. This is not an example where we could think that we could say that we think that we've got agreement. But our question isn't what happens for these anecdotes. Our question is, what is our expected performance of legend and the observational evidence that Odyssey can produce? And when I ask the question, how well does legend replicate randomized trials, we can actually see that the, the comparison of this pretty much across all of these metrics, our performance is consistent with randomized trials. So if you want to say, uh, uh, is observational data as, uh, can observational data replicate trials, I'm going to say, we can replicate trials just as good as trials can replicate trials. Now that might be fun, that's worth clapping, I guess. Um, uh, but of course, this is Odyssey, so we have to step it up a notch. Um, because it's not actually just enough to say that, yeah, this, this one case of hypertension, uh, you know, this example of 15 studies, that we really understand how this is going to work. We might actually instead want to ask the question, OK, yeah, but that's, that's a specific uh, anecdote. What if the first study was exactly repeated? That is, you know, imagine theoretically you had the same protocol and the same sites and the same 
same time with other subjects just drawn from the original population. So theoretically perfect replication. How good would these metrics do if we could actually simulate perfect replication? And it turns out that we worked on this. We figured out how to actually produce that simulation so that we could actually measure the performance of these metrics in the world where we could actually do perfect replication, a randomized trial where there's no bias at all. And when we look at perfect replication through this simulation, we can actually now provide for the first time a benchmark of exactly what these metrics are probably going to report out to us. And, and so let's use the first one, concordance z-test, it's 95%. This is actually good, because this is a z-test. This is what we all learned in Stats 101. <laughs> and so the p less than 0.05, we got a 95% chance of agreement, and that's actually what we would hope to see theoretically. But what's fascinating is the other metrics don't have the same desirable characteristics. You know, that significance decision agreement actually theoretically would have only produced a 55% agreement. <laughs> and why is that? Because even if you're drawing from the identical studies, it's really easy to have one study have a P of 0.049 and another study to have a P of 0.051. Should we really ding ourselves for disagreement because of a second decimal point? That's what that metric is doing and if we consider that our threshold, we at least need to know that that's the grounding that we see. You'll actually notice something that's interesting here. Our legend results are actually more in line with this perfect replication than even the trials. So why did the trials get higher significance decision agreement than even what's theoretically perfect? Simple answer. Trials are underpowered. Trials produce wide confidence intervals. Wide confidence intervals result in non-significant effects. If I got lots of studies with lots of non-significant effects, I pass decision agreement, because I just say both studies are not significant. And so actually, if anything, uh, this estimate of significance decision agreement is probably an overestimate of what we could expect. And actually, it gives, it gives us great solace to see that what we're looking at here uh, is suggestive of the fact that we could look across these metrics to understand what kind of performance. And whether you like a comparison of trials to trials or you like a comparison to a statistically pure, perfect replication, what we can say is that legend results is in agreement with perfect evidence uh, as best as we can do. Now, let me ask another question, though, which is, what if the first study was exactly repeated, but the second study had some sort of bias? Like, we did a biased replication. Everyone's worried about bias in observational study. So could we model something where we would understand what the bias would actually be? And it turns out, through this simulation, we could actually model bias at different levels to basically say, OK, I'm guessing at least somebody in this room thinks that Patrick's uh, full of it, that we, we aren't actually perfect. But we could instead frame the question as, how can we prove how imperfect we are. And when we did that, we evaluated a biased replication using different levels of bias to include. And what we see is actually quite reassuring. The performance of all of these metrics gets worse and worse and worse the more that there is bias. And what we can actually see is that we can now not just say that legend might be as good as perfect, but we can actually rule out the hypothesis that legend is fundamentally biased. We are actually seeing that our, our performance benchmarks somewhere between very small bias, like 20% or less, and zero bias. And I think having that bounding, that we are not going to say that we're perfect, but we can say we have some range of understanding of how much we can trust this evidence, uh, we think that that is uh, quite reassuring. Now, importantly, though, to estimate the expected performance of any of these measures, this is based on the number of samples that we have. And what we just showed you is based off of 31 studies. You remember uh, Legend, we did millions of studies. Why did we only show you 31 here? Because there was only 31 randomized trials with estimates we could compare to. But it turns out that even though we did the best of our ability, 31 studies is just not enough. Uh, a, an, any study that is done with just 30 replications is likely to produce some numbers that are suggestive, but not definitive to actually get to the precise answer of exactly how well does real world evidence work. 
what we're showing you here is just though to give you a sense of these distributions reflect what is that range of uncertainty. And what we can now report uh, in this study is there's where we are, our estimate of randomized trials to, to, to a legend, as well as that same point is where our trials match up. And you can see that even with the uncertainty that exists with only having 30 trials to compare, we can see that we're firmly between either no bias or very small bias, and we can reject the hypothesis that legend is producing uh, biased results, uh, largely biased results. So uh, that's probably good. We should be reassured that we've got some evidence. There's one little downer I gotta uh, admit to you, uh, and it's actually covered up on the slide, so that's awful. So hold on a second. The results are covered up, which that's probably not good. What if I just guessed the answer relative risk of one every single time? <laughs> Instead of doing all of this fancy epidemiology, what if I just said the answer to every trial is a relative risk of one with a confidence interval of 0.5 to two? I just don't know and I'll assume there's no effect. Well, it turns out you can actually do really good on these metrics by guessing the same answer every single time. This should worry us. Why does this worry us? It's because most drugs don't cause, don't have a comparative difference with most outcomes. It means the expectation is that if you're gonna guess something, you'd probably guess there's no difference. And if you did just guess no difference all of the time, you'll do pretty good on these metrics. The insight that we wanna share with you here is that um, agreement is not gonna be a sufficient statistic for us to prove that real world evidence is, is consistent with randomized trials, but it is a, a valuable guide. But what we can't be misled by is two trials agree because they're both insignificant, or two studies both say that we don't know and that we take that as some false assurance of evidence. Instead, what we actually need to be thinking about is how confident are we that if we say there's no difference, there actually is no difference? And how confident are we when we say there is a difference that we can actually replicate uh, that, po that positive effect? And so there's gonna be a lot more work that we as a community and the broader research community is going to need to be able to do uh, to, uh, to get our hands around what agreement is. And it seems like such a, uh, a superficially simple thing. Just show that studies agree with each other. But as we've dug into this, we realize that it's actually quite complex uh, and something that all of us need to take stock in. And we should neither uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, we don't get 100% agreement, so we're done. But we also shouldn't just immediately take solace that since I'm showing you estimates at the same level of trials, that we can just pack up and go home and trust, uh, replace randomized trials with observational studies. Uh, the, truth is, the truth is somewhere in between, and more work is gonna be needed for us to have a rigorous scientific discussion about what scientific agreement actually means. So, randomized trial, uh, re real world evidence from legend is as consistent with randomized trials as randomized trials are with each other, according to any of these metrics that we've described. There's a lot of methodologic lessons that we've gained from this. First, it is unreasonable to expect you're gonna get perfect achievement. Two, any study that's done with just a sample of 30 uh, replications is probably gonna be insufficient for us to get a definitive answer. But we need to ask ourselves the question, what is the precision we're actually looking for? Three, sample size of the studies matters. You wanna game a system, just produce underpowered studies. And that doesn't help anybody. Four, prior knowledge of studies to be replicated can be used to game an evaluation. If I know all the studies have no effect, the best thing to do is just guess no effect. And we need to make sure that we're designing scientifically valid experiments that aren't gonna mislead us in one, in one direction or the other. So the last, last two seconds, what I wanna highlight is that I've just given you a presentation about replicating past studies. And some of you might have been somewhat interested, and most of you are still reading your book. Um, uh, but I'm actually quite passionate about this, and it's not because we replicated studies, it's actually because what this actually represents. And um, I was talking to, to, to Joanne about this uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was telling her how excited I was, I was replicating studies, and she's like, yeah, but when are we gonna be able to generate evidence to answer real clinical questions that matter? And I think actually the real goal here is we need to get to the point where we're making uh, real world evidence reliable enough to be used for adequate and well controlled investigations or confirmatory evidence. Get to the point where we all have confidence that the evidence we're generating is useful. And I'll submit that 
The FDA and other regulators have already provided us beautiful guidelines of what we as a community need to do. They have defined the threats to validity, they've defined the challenges that need to be overcome, and it's our obligation as a community to raise our science and meet these needs. And I would submit that we are making tremendous progress on each and every one of these. I don't think we have hardly any studies that I could point to in the literature that satisfy all of these requirements, but I think we could use this as the aspiration about what real world evidence would actually look like in a way that could actually get us to that point of making good clinical decisions. But remember, real world evidence is different from trials, so we expect it to actually not just be similar possibly, but also better in many dimensions. And we need to think about the clinical scenarios where real-world evidence is actually going to contribute uh, to medical decision-making. And so just to bring this full circle to what we did in Legend last year, we can use real-world evidence to resolve uncertainty from randomized trials where the trials uh, uh, to uncover significant differences between treatments. Remember. Um, for uh, uh, ACE inhibitors and thiazide diuretics, the clinical guideline says that there's no difference. But the work that Mark Suchard has led in our community is actually suggestive that there is potentially a difference and that thiazide diuretics may be more safe and effective. And our estimate is in full agreement with the clinical trials. It's just that we had more power. We can also resolve uncertainty from trials to increase the comfort in bounding our effects. So if I look at the guidelines, they say there's no difference between ACE inhibitors and uh, angiotensin reception blockers, but look at that confidence interval. It goes from 0.12 to 1.8. So when we say there's no difference, we're basically saying it's either a tenfold difference in one direction or a twofold difference in the other direction. Well, Ray Chen is actually leading a study in our community to actually show that these drugs do look similarly effective and actually being able to provide a tight confidence intervals so that we can have understanding of that. A lot of these questions don't even have randomized trial evidence at all. This question of chlorthalidone versus hydrochlorothiazide, the clinical guideline actually says chlorthalidone is preferred, but there's no trials that answer that question. There's an ongoing clinical trial at the VA right now that will report out in three years, but we can use our evidence now. And so George uh, is leading a study in the Odyssey community to specifically look at whether chlorthalidone or hydrochlorothiazide are different. And most importantly, this clinical guideline introduced for the first time an expert opinion that suggested that if you're a patient who has hypertension, you may want to consider starting on combination therapy right away rather than monotherapy. And they acknowledge in the guideline that this is only expert opinion. So can't our real world evidence fill this gap and try to understand is monotherapy or combo therapy uh, really better? And this is the work that Harlan and I are, are proud to be leading for the community to try to fill this gap where there's no trials available. So the journey from getting from real world evidence for regulatory decision making, I think that uh, the analogy of the tent post is important here. We need to do all of these things together to get to the point where we can trust our evidence. We need to build confidence in our data. And so I think that the work that Andrew and Claire presented is essential for our community to be taking on. We need to establish scientific best practices that we agree to as a community and we consistently apply, which is why I'm so proud of Martine and the work that has been done to establish the Book of Odyssey. But I think we all need to be continuing to go after this target of proving reliable real world evidence. And while the work that George and I have done to replicate trials, I think is an important first step and it should give us a level of comfort, I would also uh, implore all of you to be thinking about how we can do more research to continue to prove out the reliability of this evidence. So with that, I'm going to ask our panel to come up.